This is Host Jockeys Unite, the only episodic podcast that strives to not only educate and entertain those in emergency services, but to give an inside peek inside the fire and EMS services to the general public. We are here to leave a legacy for future generations. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Edwards and Jay Gallagher. Hello and welcome back to Host Jockeys Unite. I'm your host, Chris Edwards, and this is my co-host, Jay Gallagher. Hello, good neighbors. And in this episode, we're going to learn about two fire phenomena that are extremely dangerous, backdraft and flashovers. We will explore the difference between these two conditions, what causes them, and how to recognize the warning signs that they are about to occur. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'm Chris Edwards, and I'm the host of the podcast, and I'm going to give you a little information about myself and Jay Gallagher. I began my fire career about six years ago as a volunteer firefighter and took all my certifications that were required, all my classes. I then moved into a career firefighter position about six months ago to a year ago where I obtained my EMT certification. Jay, uh, when did you begin your fire service? Uh, Counting my explorer time, uh, it started in 1986. And I retired in 2015, so that's, what, 29 years. Uh, I've, I've had a long and uh, rewarding career. And what positions have you held throughout your career in the fire service and explain these positions? Uh, I did everything from a uh, basic grunt firefighter uh, for the driver operator, lieutenant, captain, uh, the only positions I have not held is any, like, uh, assistant chief or chief's positions, uh, with the exception of I was chief for uh, about a year, year and a half of a uh, kind of a CERT-based uh, um, uh, emergency response group. Yeah, you're, you're uh, t- talking about REACT. That's where we actually met each other. Exactly, and it's, it's hard to believe it's been this long. Been ten, at least ten years. Yeah. No. Um, and so you retired as a captain from the fire service. That is correct. Ladies and gentlemen, now is time for the show that's called "Ask the Firefighter." This is where we take questions sent in by you, and do our best of our ability to answer them. The email address, if you have a question, will be at the end of this segment. So, without further ado, Chris, as a firefighter, what is the first thing you should do when you arrive on the scene of a fire? Well, first of all, remain calm. Calm down, look out the window of the apparatus, and start a visual scene size up. At the same time, start listening to your officer in charge to find out what they want you to do. Uh, things like, is my assignment to exit the apparatus and grab the hydrant bag and lay a line, a supply line to the hydrant? Or am I supposed to don my SCBA and be ready to make entry to carry out a search and rescue mission? They may even want you to, you know, pack up, be ready to pull an attack line to the door in preparation to get water on the fire once the incident commander completes his 360 degree walk around. Now, while I'm visually sizing up the scene, what hazards am I going to look for? What do I notice? Like, uh, are there electric lines on the ground that could be deadly if I step on them or get too close to them? Do I see someone in the window waving for help? Are there signs that I notice that indicate danger of an explosion? To me, arriving at a structure fire isn't completely unlike pulling into a parking lot at work. When I arrive at a structure fire, I'm there to do a job. And I've been there before, and I've, so it's not my first fire, and I'll do it again. So it's not all special in that mind. Just like garbage men don't get too excited when they pull up to an address and find a trash can. Firefighters, you know, generally shouldn't be overly excited when they pull up to an address where a fire has been reported and find flames shooting up the side. It's just part of the job. And if you have any questions about the fire or EMS service that you would like to be answered on the show, or if you'd like to learn how to become more involved in the firefighter service or EMS service, please email us at firefighter274 at outlook.com. And welcome back. As we know, backdraft and flashover are a common everyday concern on any working fire. But what exactly are they? What causes them? And what can we do to lessen the chances of them occurring? In this show, we will discuss this question and attempt to pass along some solutions to greatly reduce the chances of it ever happening to you. 
Jay? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines a backdraft as a phenomenon in which a fire that has consumed all available oxygen suddenly explodes when more oxygen is made available, typically because a door or window has been opened. So basically, the uh, the fire has burned all of the oxygen out of the room. So, for, so go ahead. So it's not just a blockbuster movie then. Exactly. Uh, for uh, people who are just get, for folks who are just getting into the fire service or are enthusiasts, uh, it takes four things for a fire to burn. It takes a heat source, a fuel source, and a air source. And the chemical chain reaction of all of these to make fire. Now, when a fire burns, it's burning up the oxygen if it's in a semi-sealed off or sealed off room. And it will burn all the oxygen out, which will bring it to what is called the smoldering stage. But we'll get into that a little bit later. And all it's looking for is somebody to open a door or when or open a window and get that fresh breath of oxygen and then boom here we go again free burning stage now knowing the signs of a backdraft will definitely save your life and the life of the crews that are operating around you uh be on the look at look out sorry about that for such things as black smoke becoming dense grayish yellow without visible flame the smoke color is indicating incomplete combustion usually the darker the smoke um the more incomplete the combustion is and a well sealed building might indi indicate air confinement and excessive heat buildup High concentrations of flammable carbon monoxide could be present as a result of incomplete combustion. Little to no visible flame. If flames are present, they may be blue in color. Another indicator might be flames and smoke exiting the structure, especially in eaves of the, of the structure. Smoke leaving the building in puffs and being drawn back in. It will look like the building is breathing. Right, the fire is trying to find that oxygen that we were talking about previously. And this is the appearance of the smoke pulling in under doors or through the cracks. Smoke stained windows is a big indicator. That's one thing that when you were doing your three six or your walk around or your initial size up you want to look at is the windows. If they're brown in color, uh with visible cracking, that's another uh sign of it. And then the sudden rapid movement of air and smoke inward when the opening is made. The backdraft happens during the decay stage of the fire. Because the fire, like I had said before, has burned up all of the available oxygen in the fire area. Opening a door or a window will introduce that gulp of oxygen that it wants, causing the backdraft explosion and return to the free burn stage of the incident. Now, the only way to prevent a backdraft is to vent the structure above the fire area immediately upon arrival even if there is a rescue that is needed to be performed venting must now pay close attention to this folks venting must be done before entering the structure having your engine crew in a safe position ready to enter once the venting is complete with a rit crew standing by if you don't know what rit is it's rapid intervention team they go in and, and bail out the firefighters when they get in trouble now the writ team uh standing by is a critical and to ensure further 
escalation and damage is quickly mitigated. So basically, folks, what we're saying is once that fire burns all of the oxygen out, what it goes to the smoldering stage. There's the stages of a fire is the incipient or beginning stage, the growth, pre burn, decay, and smoldering. Now, backdraft usually happens more towards the end where it goes from uh, decay to smoldering because everything, like I said, has, the fire has burned up all the available oxygen in the building. Now, can you have a room in a building, let's just say Walmart, for instance, if you have a, can you have a fire in one of their storage areas and it backdraft and not affect the rest of the store? Yes, it can happen. It's very rare, but it, it, it can happen. Same thing in a house. If you have a fire in the bedroom, the people were smart enough when they left, when they evacuated to close the door. Now, the fires burned all the oxygen out of the bedroom. You make your you go to make your entry. Can that room backdraft on you? Yes, it can. So you it needs to be during the three sixty. Check your windows for staining and cracking. Uh, watch your smoke. Watch the color. Watch for color change in the smoke. Um, and if you take all of these factors into consideration, you'll be safe. Well, true, and you were mentioning before about ventilation. You can't just run onto a fire scene and willy-nilly, you know, ventilate a house. You have to be careful, coordinated, and have planned uh, ventilation because, you know, if you introduce, introduce too much oxygen, it can be just as bad as not having any, and then any victims will still not be viable. Exactly. Um, when you're dealing with a backdraft situation, uh, you don't want to bust out any windows. Uh, you go to the you go to the roof to do your vent, and let it come up through the ceiling, you know, and through the roof straight up. And any victim you had that might may be inside will you know still be viable as long as they haven't you know deceased from you know the fire previous to. Um, after that. If you if you need to vent windows to further help vent smoke or heat, then do so. But the first the first place you want to go for venting during if you're faced with that situation is to the see is to the roof vent through the roof. Right, you always see all these stories and movies, and first thing you see is firefighters jump off the truck and immediately just start breaking windows, and that's not how it really is. No. If you think back to the case study of the uh, super uh, sofa store Charleston there in Charleston, yeah, the Charleston Nine, part of what happened that caused that fire to to grow so quickly was the fact that they busted out the big showroom windows in the front of the building. Now, the reason they done that was to get the firefighters out that were calling Mayday. That at the time, that was their only viable option was to bust those windows, get in there to get them out. But unfortunately, by doing that, it also pissed off the fire and it rolled through the structure. And unfortunately, we lost nine brothers that day. So, it's it you know in a situation like that, it it was it was a crapshoot, but. You know, because the the roof, if I remember correctly, was uh, was bowstring construction. I don't with, uh, I believe it was. I'll I'll, I'll find I'll research again and find out for sure. And, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself on the next show. Well, but, actually, uh, you know, actually, I think that's what our next show is going to be on is the Charleston Nine case. So, 
Okay. We'll uh, go really into detail with it next show. Now, okay, that's that's cool. Um, I forgot that one uh, that we were going to do that. So yeah, that that'd be the perfect time. So, you get you, do you have any more questions on flashover or not flashover but backdraft, Chris? Uh, none that I know of. Go ahead and continue on with the flashover. Uh, okay. Now we get into the flashover. A flashover is the near simultaneous ignition of most of the du- directly exposed combustible material in an enclosed area. When certain organic materials are heated, they undergo thermal decomposition and release flammable gases. Flashover occurs where most of the exposed surfaces in the space that are heated to their auto ignition temperature and emit flammable gases. Flashover normally occurs at 932 degrees Fahrenheit and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit for ordinary combustibles and an incident heat flux of at the floor level of 20 kilowatts per square meter. An example of a flashover is the is the ignition of a piece of furniture, say a couch or recliner, uh, in the living room, and the fire involving the initial piece of furniture can produce a layer of hot sm- hot smoke, which spreads across the ceiling, as we all know, and drops it starts dropping to the floor. The hot buoyant smoke layer grows in depth and thickness as it is bounded by the walls of the room. Now, the radiant heat from this layer heats the surfaces of the directly exposed combustible materials in the room, causing them to give off flammable gases via pyro... pyro, I've always had trouble saying that word. What he said. Uh, When the temperature of the evolved gases becomes high enough, these gases will ignite throughout their extent which means that these gases are you know full are full of smoke of the smoke now what what do we say smoke was unburned fuel in, incomplete incomplete combustion smoke is flammable folks and that's where you that helps your flashover right on along now flashover is one of the most feared phenomena among firefighters, I got the hiccups, I'm sorry, y'all. Firefighters are taught to recognize the signs of imminent rollovers and flashovers and to avoid backdrafts. Now, for example, they have a certain routine for opening closed doors to to get into buildings and the compartments inside the building that are on fire. Now, this is known as door entry procedures ensuring fire crew safety where wherever it's possible now some of you may be wondering can you survive a back or a, survive a flashover not likely not the heat at, produced i was gonna say not at 900 to 1100 degrees no um the heat produced by these flashovers is not survivable for more than just a few seconds, even when you're wearing your full protective gear, including CBA. And if you are lucky enough to survive a flashover, you're likely to be severely burned uh, to the point where surgeries and skin grafts and everything, and you won't you won't look like your old self. And I don't mean that as it to sound like a joke or anything, but you won't. Now, flashover happens between the growth and the fully developed stages of the, of the fire. Now, some signs of impending flashover that, uh, uh, that you becoming proficient in learning the signs of an impending flashover will save your life. High heat concentrations or flaming, flaming combustion overhead. You'll you'll know because 
usually when we go into a fire, we, we crawl in, everything's fine. Flash over will bring the heat right down to the floor to where you'll be pressing the Velcro on your turnout coat for keeping you that much higher up off the floor. It will get extremely hot. The existence of ghosting tongues of flames over your head, which is known as rollover. Now, rollover, some some people get rollover and flashover confused. One precedes the other, but they're not the same. The rollover is where the the gases that are in the smoke individually hit their uh, ignition auto ignition temperature. ignition exactly their auto ignition temperature and just kind of little fire you know flame tongues of flame out. To where flashover, when it happens, everything goes. Um, the the lack of water droplets falling back to the floor following a short burst fog pattern, bringing being directed uh, right at the ceiling. Um, that's another indication. What's happening is that fire is so hot that the droplets aren't even producing enough steam to cool, to cool it off. The fire is actually outrunning your water, so to speak. Um, some departments, they have started going to the smooth bore initial attack, and that's fine. And in all honesty, you have a better chance of penetrating the thermal column that that fire is producing with a smooth bore and cooling that ceiling temperature off, which in turn will cool the room down, than you would a fog nozzle. Although we all know that fog nozzle get in trouble, left for life, up in the air, you know. But the the smooth bore will penetrate that thermal column and cool that temperature down. I mean, I don't know. If I've had an adjustable nozzle before, and I've used the straight stream setting on it to cool the thermal column, and it did just well. And it wasn't technically a smooth bore. It's just, you know, using less fog and more straight stream to disrupt that that thermal column temperature as far as, now, as, far as that goes. If you don't have a smooth bore, it's just pointing it up and popping the bale open a couple of times to cool it off and keep on getting yeah. it. Yeah, just pencil the ceiling with it. But, um, you know, even with using the straight stream of a adjustable nozzle, you're still not going to get the penetration that you would with a true smoothbore nozzle. Because even though with that nozzle, even though you have it on your straight stream, you're still getting little water droplets coming out. I know it don't look, I know it don't look like it, but you're still getting those little water droplets right. to where with the smooth bore, it's just one solid stream of water. Right. And I'm aware of that. It's just, I'm saying if you don't have a smooth bore, you can do the, accomplish the same thing with a straight stream. Well, exactly. I mean, you could, it might take a little bit longer, but, but you could, I was just uh, telling the difference for the ones who, you know, are, you know, not into the fire service yet or, enthusiasts or just are just starting out all right gotcha gotcha so nothing nothing toward nothing nothing towards you dude you're you're good so how do we combat a flashover we eliminate superheated air and gases from the compartment that's burning and depending on the fire you can call for horizontal or vertical ventilation. This is one time where it really don't matter a hundred, yeah, a hundred percent where you vent. Just as long as you get those gases and heat out of the compartment, to where with backdraft you have to do it right over the fire area on the uh, on the roof. Uh, just be conscious of the venting, though, and the location of the fire. Uh, 
if you vent in the wrong, you know, in the wrong spot, it could get other portions of the uh, that are uninvolved structure involved. Now, here's the big one, folks. Know when it's time to go. In a life-threatening situation, retreat is not, it's not an act of cowardice. Remember, firefighters that have seen a flashover are either dead or severely burned, even with full PPE uh, in place. So again, venting is venting the structure along with immediate water application once venting is complete is key to the safety and survival when faced with a flashover situation. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that. Um, as far as training goes, the flashover simulator probably has to be my most favorite training thing to ever do. It's just amazing to sit there on the ground and watch this column of fire just like grow over your head and just zoom over your head and you're seeing nothing but the whole ceiling on fire. It's It's just totally amazing to me. And for those of you who don't know what it is, it's basically a two-layer or two-story cargo container that there's a fire built on the upper level, and then firefighters sit on the lower level, so it's actually safe to be down to be in it when it flashes over. And the superheated gases and the smoke build up in the upper level, and then the fire eventually catches on to the smoke, and it travels the whole length of the container, but... Just to sit there and watch that fire go above your head is just amazing. I imagine. So you're you're lucky. They didn't have that uh, flashover simulator uh, when I was on the department and on the job. It, that came about uh, right after I retired out, and I never got to do that. I watched YouTube videos on it. I've watched your YouTube video on it that that you did when you were doing it. Yeah, and they and, have, and it, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm saying they have smaller scale um, models that you can do flashovers and see how it does, but it's not the same as actually being in it. You know, they have the little doll houses that you can make to to um, simulate different burning conditions of structures, mm -hmm. but it's just not the same as actually being in there and watching it. And it's just a way to safely and control create a flashover and be able to watch basically the smoke behavior and the fire behavior during a flashover so you can see what what causes it. You can see how the smoke is acting and and uh, things like that. Uh, if, if I was still on the department and I had the opportunity to do it, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Because, uh, you know, the only other time you're going to be able to see something like that is being in the room with the real deal, and we all know how that's going to turn out. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the segment that we call Pro Tip, Tip of the Show. This is where we leave you with our knowledge from our experiences to help you be safe and come home to the ones that love you. Chris, what's today's tip? Today's tip is how to prepare for your next firefighter job interview. Now, being a firefighter requires strength, motivation, and a sense of community. During interviews for firefighter positions, hiring managers ask questions to judge these important qualities and more. You will need to prepare for your interview in advance so that you show your best firefighter skills and experience. The following tips will help you to pass that those nerve-wracking oral interviews and land that dream job. Number one, come dress for success. Most fire departments look for candidates that dress in business casual attire or better for your interview, meaning business casual or even more dressier. However, it is not wrong to check in with the firehouse to confirm what you should wear. Make sure your clothes are clean and free of wrinkles to give you a professional and positive impression. Number two, share your passion for firefighting. Show a strong passion for firefighting by answering questions enthusiastically and referring to previous firefighting experiences that you found rewarding. Use specific examples. When asked about your career choice, explain your, to your interviewer what you enjoy the most about the job and what inspired you to pursue this field. At the beginning of your interview, let the hiring manager know you are excited about the opportunity and want to learn more about the firehouse and its staff. 
Number three, provide strong examples of previous experience. The hiring manager will ask you questions to learn about your work ethic and style. Make sure to provide strong and detailed examples of your previous work experience and expand on the job and expand on the jobs listed on your resume. Choose th- two or three skills to describe your style to give hiring managers a good idea of how you work. Number four, be honest about the challenges you faced. It's common practice to receive questions that ask you to describe the difficult choices you made in your past experiences. Hiring managers ask these tough questions because they want to better understand your decision-making skills. Many in the field recognize that firefighting is a complicated and often unsafe career that requires commitment. During your interview, be honest about the challenges you faced as a firefighter and how you overcame them. A strong candidate does not let challenging moments dissuade them from firefighting and uses these moments of adversity as motivation. Number five, show your willingness to commit. A strong commitment is a valuable component that hiring managers look for in a candidate. During your interview, the hiring manager will want to see how committed you are to your role as a firefighter. Before your interview, consider what committed means to you and how you demonstrate strong ties in your personal and professional life. Give two or three reasons why you want to stay with the firehouse long term. Number six, talk about integrity and ethics. During your interview, the hiring manager might ask questions regarding integrity and ethics to see if you understand these values and apply them in your work. As a firefighter, you must make quick decisions that involve the safety of the community and the lives of others. When you use integrity and ethics to guide you in your decision-making process, you make honest and honorable and trustworthy choices. Before your interview, take some time to collect examples of times when you demonstrated integrity and and ethics to have experiences to reference during your interview. Number seven, practice answering common interview questions. The best way to prepare, prepare for an interview is to practice your answers to common firefighter interview questions. After looking for popular interview questions, think about your own answers by reflecting on your previous experience. Make sure that you think about what questions interviewers ask you in the past and reflect on your answers. Try practicing your answers in front of a mirror or with a friend or family member or even a coworker to get feedback about your responses. Number eight, review technical language. Firefighters and first responders use a set of codes and terms on the job to communicate quickly and effectively. While you can probably... Quickly recall that the most common terms and codes, it can be useful to review all the technical language in case you get interview questions about them. Read your handbooks and guides, or you could even make flashcards to memorize definitions. Number nine, prepare several copies of your resume. Bring four or five copies of your resume to your interview to distribute to those interviewers who need or will like one. It's a great idea it's a great idea to put them together in a binder and make them look professional and include copies of all your certifications and letters of references or letters of recommendation along with, along with a cover letter. This shows that you are prepared, which is a useful and impressive quality for a firefighter. Number 10, listen to your interviewers. Actively listen to your interviewers' questions and comments to ensure you fully understand them. Actively listening means not only hearing their words, but also understanding their tone, facial cues, and body language. Interpreting all this information can help you deliver answers that keep the hiring manager's interest. Number 11. Know the positions of the firehouse employees. At every firehouse, certain firefighters have specific positions that designate their responsibility and role. Find out the title of each firefighter by looking at the firehouse's website and reviewing each firefighter's information. During the interview, address these people by their appropriate titles, such as Captain, chief, assistant chief, deputy chief, etc., to show respect for their authority. If you are unsure about a title, ask during the interview and make a note to remember. Number 12. Be transparent about your knowledge. Firehouses rely on transparent firefighters because an open and honest employee is reliable and trustworthy. In firefighter, it is common for staff to communicate quickly and transparently to avoid confusion. Show that you a transparent candidate by answering questions clearly and making sure your answers are consistent with your resume. 
If you are unsure about how to answer a question or unfamiliar with a specific term, let the interviewer know. 13. Talk about leadership skills you possess. Although you might not serve as a leader right from the start, leadership qualities are incredibly valuable in firefighting because you have many positions regardless of your position, many responsibilities regardless of your position. In situations regarding others' lives, you may re you rely on leadership skills to make the right decisions for yourself and your crew. During your interview, talk about leadership qualities you possess and how you use them in your work. Number 14. Use the STAR method when answering situational questions. During your interview, the hiring manager, the hiring manager will ask you questions that require you to explain different situations in detail. When asked how to give a specific example, when asked to give a specific example, use the STAR interview technique to illustrate your story and explain what you learned from the experience. STAR stands for Situation. Describe an issue you encountered. Task. Detail your, your role in the situation. Action. Explain the steps that you took to overcome the issue. Result. Describe the results of your actions. Using this technique is a great way to clearly outline a story with specific results. Number 15. Share your community involvement. A firefighter's objective is to help the community stay healthy and safe. If you participate in any community events or organizations, feel free to share this during the interview. Firehouses appreciate firefighters who dedicate their time and energy to the community and its members because it shows they care about others. Number 16. Convey a sense of loyalty. Loyalty in a firefighter is a vital characteristic because Firehouse invests time and money in each trainee. Your hiring manager wants to make sure you plan on staying with the firehouse for a while and devoting yourself to the team. Reflect on what you believe makes loyal makes a loyal firefighter and how you align with those characteristics. Number 17. Show your customer service skills. It is important to share your customer service skills during your interview because, as a firefighter, you interact with many community members, both in the firehouse and on the job. You work with people who have a variety of personalities. Make sure to share the customer service skills you learned from past employment and explain how you use these techniques as a firefighter. Number 18. Be personable and friendly. The firehouse wants to know if you make a good fit for their work culture. Be personable and friendly during the interview to show that you easily get along with others. At the start of your interview, give a firm handshake and a friendly smile. These gestures are easily remembered by hiring managers who pay attention to how you behave throughout the interview. Number 19, show a willingness to learn. As a new firefighter, you undergo extensive training that requires you to learn and remember new information. A willingness to learn means taking your education seriously by training and studying on your own. During your interview, explain how you prepared for all types of tests such as physicals and exams. Number 20, demonstrate a positive attitude. Positivity is a key in staying optimistic in a sometimes stressful environment. You can project your po positive mood on others helping them remain calm and focused, which is necessary when responding to calls. During your interview, keep your responses positive while acknowledging the challenges you face as a firefighter. Show that you understand the value of a positive attitude when approaching difficult tasks and responsibilities. Number 21. Show your independence. Even though firefighters work as a team, there are some situations where you need to make decisions and act independently. Show that you can be independent and be confident in and detail specific situations where you work independently in your answers. Last but not less, last but not least, number 22. Arrive early and be prepared. Arriving about 15 minutes early with all the necessary materials, like your resume, notepad, and pen, shows that you're eager for, to interview for this position. Since firefighters often need to react quickly to a variety of emergency situations, being prepared just demonstrates a valuable quality that many firehouses seek. Jay, do you have any opinions on this? Hey, everything sounds good that you uh that you presented to everybody. Um the only thing that uh I can tell everybody is uh when you go for a uh position in the fire department or uh EMS, uh don't go to work for your dad. <laughs> cuz uh, cuz that's what I did and uh I know why he done it, but everything 
was made harder on me to prove that there was no favoritism, that I knew what I was doing and I knew my stuff. Um, so, you know, so no one could say, well, he's the chief's son, you know, so that's how he got that position. No, when we did the, like when we did the captain's test, everybody else got a test of 150 questions. My test was 325 questions. So I had to know that much more than the guy sitting next to me to get the to get the position. And you, you want to talk about every anything and everything that you could think of to be put on the test. He he did it. Um, put it on my test again, so it wouldn't be uh, any favoritism shown. So that's my advice to everybody on it. But uh, everything that Chris has uh, put out for you uh, is excellent information uh, for when you go for your interview. And it's not necessarily just for fire or EMS. It could be an interview for anything that you want to do in life. Well, Jay, it's been a great show. And my final thoughts on the show, my takeaway from today's episode is this. Practice, practice, and more practice. Train like your life depends on it, because it does. Know the differences between a backdraft and a flashover. Know when they can occur and how they will occur. Most importantly, learn how to read smoke. Knowing how the smoke is reacting to the fire conditions gives you the best picture of what is probably about to happen. As an IC, use carefully planned and coordinated ventilation to mitigate the possibilities of those of these events from happening and making an environment more tenable for all involved. Jay, what are your thoughts? As you said, uh, practice, 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 uh, I'm going to uh, say vent, vent, vent. Because if you, once you ventilate the structure, you greatly reduce the chances of a backdraft or a flashover. Um, for those who uh, are not in the fire service yet or new to it, the movie Backdraft, they portray it one way and versus the reality of it. I've never seen a door get sucked shut and then bulge out. I've never seen little wisps of smoke come out from under the door and then get sucked right back in. It's uh it's a whole totally different animal in in real life. And movies are just that for our entertainment. I mean, if if they done it the real way, you know, like it like it does in like it happens in real life, you'd never see Kurt Russell's face. You'd never see uh, Baldwin's face or uh, any of them. Um, so just make sure you vent. And every opportunity you get to train, train. Um, if you get the opportunity to go to the flashover simulator, go. If nothing else, so I could live vicariously through you. Because it's cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Um, but just be safe, uh, guys. You know, you got people to go home to, so... Learn your trade and master your craft. Hey, Jay. Hmm. How many truckies does it take to change the light bulb? Hey, 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 hey. How many? All right, I'll bite. How many? You'll need five. One to change the light bulb while the others cut a hole in the roof and hold the ladder. Okay, folks. With that, this is the end of the show. Uh, We hope you've enjoyed it today. And... Uh, we'll talk about the trucky joke here later, Chris. <laughs> don't forget, don't forget to tune into our next episode where we'll delve into the case study of the Charleston sofa sofa superstore fire that claimed the lives Easy of, for you to say. that claimed the lives of nine Charleston firefighters. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. We're listed on all the major services. We'll see you next time. 
You've been listening to Hose Jockeys Unite. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and please tell your friends about us. And always, always remember, even truckies need love, too.